Welcome, everybody. Nice to uh, see you. If I drop my voice uh, and uh, you can't hear at the back, just wave and I'll do my best to get it back up again. But uh, my name's Glyn Harrison. I'm um, a retired psychiatrist. I was an academic psychiatrist at the university in Bristol um, until I retired seven years ago or so and um, enjoying now in my retirement, um, thinking about how some of the big issues I grappled with in psychiatry relate to theology and the scriptures in, in a more intentional way. I have the time and the opportunities to do that. And of course, one of the areas that you would expect a psychiatrist to be interested in is this whole area of sex, sexuality, and, uh, and that's really the background from which I, I come to this. So uh, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for coming. This is the first of two parts. There are two peas in a pod. They, they go together. So we'll end this afternoon with a cliffhanger. <laughs> and uh, we'll complete the, the second half on Wednesday afternoon at the same time. So... That, that's, that's how it's going to work. Let's pray before we go any further. Gracious Father, we thank you as we gather again together to think together. Uh, we want our thoughts to be in line with yours. And uh, we, want to, we want to draw on our knowledge of Scripture and to draw on the way you've shaped our hearts and minds to know and love you. And as we grapple with some of the challenges in our culture. Help us, help us to do that with your mind, but also with your heart. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, does anybody recognize this film? It's called The Magdalene Sisters. Does that ring a bell? The Magdalene Sisters. I think it was about 2003. And it's a moving and very, it was Oscar-nominated, but it, it was a, a moving story of um, four young girls who were effectively incarcerated or put away in what were called Magdalene Laundry Asylums. And this one was set in, Northern, in, in, in Ireland, and um, they were run usually by the Catholic Church, but other groups sometimes were involved, and they were for fallen women. They were for women who'd had a baby out of wedlock. And uh, the basis on which people were put into these laundry asylums, and they, they worked in the laundries and kept there, the legal basis has always been obscure. In fact, the Irish government had an inquiry into the legal basis of the being put in these asylums. But whatever the legal situation, the public shame that surrounded these women who'd had children outside of wedlock was usually enough to place them into these asylums and out of public sight. And you can see here that they were under, in this particular story, these four women they were under the regime of some brutal nuns who humiliated them. And one of them, as happened to many children in these asylums, their children were adopted away without their knowledge or against their will, which again was the subject of the Irish government inquiry. And I think this, this uh, vignette illustrates something of, of the history through which people view our teaching and understanding of sex, sexuality, marriage, and children. Um, the sense of shame that we've allowed to cluster around this whole area. And there were hundreds of these asylums across Europe and North America, and the last one didn't close until 1996. So, shame fear, ignorance. But today, we would call these women single mums. Single mums. And in most parts of the UK now, 
the number of children born out of wedlock is nearly the same as those born in marriage. What a huge social revolution has taken place in the past 50 years. So sex, relationships, marriage, children. Um, we've always found it difficult though, haven't we as Christians, to, to talk about this, this whole area of sex. Partly an intrusion into our Christian subculture of a, a kind of a Gnostic heretical thinking that the body is bad and it's inferior to the spirit or platonic thinking which has insinuated a similar conviction or pattern of thinking about, about what it means to be human. Body bad, spirit, soul good. And we've always found it hard to talk about it. I remember when I was a, a little boy of about na eight or nine and um, hearing a word on the radio and I thought I knew what it meant and I thought I could embarrass my grandmother by asking her. So I said to her, Granny, what does the word pregnant mean? Pregnant? We're talking about 1953, 54 here, okay? And you know what she said? She looked terribly embarrassed, so I was quite pleased. <laughs> but do you know what she said? She said, I don't know. I don't know what the word pregnant means. Now, I'd been listening in some of the conversations at school, and I was pretty sure, as she was my granny, that she did know what being pregnant meant in a very real way, let's say. Um, but something of her inability even to talk about childbirth with a nine-year-old is an indicator of something of the culture of fear and ignorance and shame with which we have shrouded this whole area. And so I, and I suspect many of you, grew up into my experience of having been made sexual and my body coming alive at age 12, 13, with sexual feelings and longings and urges and attractions. I came into that experience, as I suspect many of you, in fear and ignorance and shame about having a body that did these things. And nobody talked about it. Now, we might say that that was yesterday. Things are different, better today. Are they? In our culture, in our homes, how many of us can really honestly say that our Christian family <coughs> or our church was the place where we learned about the goodness under God of our erotic longings. Where did we ever get any sense of feeling about the goodness of these feelings? And uh, I suppose in many of our homes and churches, if sex were a food, we've been putting each other on the starvation diet. Starvation there. Now, about the same time I was cross-questioning my, my poor granny, uh, a man called Hugh Hefner in the United States. Hugh Hefner founding a magazine which he released, the first mass-market girly magazine in 1953. And uh, Hugh Hefner... looking back on the launch of Playboy, as it was called, says one of the reasons I founded that magazine was because of the, quote, hurt and hypocrisy of my religious upbringing. He'd finish with the starvation diet, you see. He was saying from now on, it's fast food. And tell me, if people have a choice between starvation or fast food? What do you think they're going to choose? And so a revolution was born, a sexual revolution that has changed our culture in 50 years beyond anything we could have imagined possible. Look at some of the 
data here, we see that from the 60s, as the revolution gets going, we see the, just the raw numbers of divorces rocketing sixfold in the United Kingdom. Then it levels off and even fell a little, but part of that is explained by marriage itself, which reached a peak in the early 60s, suddenly going into a deep and prolonged recession. Fewer people were getting married, so fewer people are getting divorced because the numbers overall are small. It's not the entire explanation, but we can see that there are profound social changes underway. And that recession of marriage, the collapse of marriage, has been especially prominent amongst the poorest. And in some areas of the UK, um, up to two-thirds of children in the most underprivileged housing estates, in the poorest, most desperate areas, fatherless wastelands, in which two-thirds of children are born outside of wedlock, single mums. And as this revolution got underway, we have effectively normalised the notion of sex outside of marriage and across co much of Western culture, cohabitation is the norm. Um, as a result of these changes, nearly half of children, as I've said, born out of wedlock in the UK by the age of 16, only a half of children will be found living with two biological parents in the home. So you have a 50% chance of getting to the age of 16 with two biological parents living in the home. Couples of the same sex can get married. And anyway, we're no longer sure what, what the word sex means anymore. This is the revolution that followed the collapse of those old Christian convictions that sex is, for, is, is within God's gift of marriage between one man and one woman. Uh, when that collapsed, uh, these are the rapidly accelerating social cultural changes that followed in its wake, and it's the revolution in which we are immersed. Now, many Christians seem to have been hoping that if we just keep our heads down long enough, the whole wretched business will go away, sort itself out. A lot of church leaders have certainly been hoping that, and I can understand why. You think, why doesn't our church leaders kind of say something or, or instill a little confidence around here as to what we believe. But of course, they, like you, they don't want their whole ministry to be hijacked by a slip of the tongue and the wrath of the Twitter mob on them or the local newspaper. And so we're fearful in this environment about speaking positively about this whole area. And when church leaders such as Church of England bishops do feel kind of, they're flushed out, forced to issue some kind of statement, say on, on marriage, it reads more like the terms and conditions of a software upgrade than a vision, a manifesto for human flourishing, and the goodness of God's provision for human beings. And the problem is it isn't going away. It continues to unravel and uh, we sit here like King Canute, hoping, but the waves just keep on coming. So we've got to face this revolution more intentionally, more intelligently, more analytically than hitherto. And when we begin to do that, I don't know about you, but I, I find myself asking, what is the secret of its power? Such vast cultural change in such a relatively short period of time. I don't know whether you've heard of the uh, political theorist Joseph Nye. He coined a term I think you will have heard of. He, he scratched his head and said, where one nation seeks to influence another, there are different kinds of power by which they can do that. There's hard power, you send in the troops, or there's soft power. And what's soft power? Hard power is coercion. Soft power is the ability to get what you want using attraction. 
Now, we know that the revolutionaries have hard power. As we've said, say the wrong thing and the social media gangsters are knocking at your door, humiliating you, shaming you. But we've often missed the real secret of the revolutionary success, I, I submit to you, which is soft power. It's what makes its ideas, its vision, its narrative so compelling to the human spirit. We want it. What is it that makes us want this thing? And the revolutionaries came along with attractive new ideas, attractive ideology compelling moral vision and an inspiring story. And we need a critique that gets behind this to try and understand what's, what's going on and the ideas that, that drove this revolution forward. So that's what we're going to do just now. We're going to just try and look in a little more detail about what's been going on. And, and let me say, this is a complex area. The bottom line is lots of things have been going on and contributing to driving this revolution forward, this vast cultural change. It isn't one thing or another thing. That There are multiple factors that are working together. For example, if we had an economist here, he'd say, I'll tell you, the you know, forget all this attractive ideology. What drove this revolution was the post-war economic boom that liberated women from patriarchy. They worked for themselves. They got new benefits. They were freed from being shackled to their husbands. And with those freedoms came new sexual patterns of behavior. It's an economic issue. Or if you're a public health physician, an epidemiologist called, You'd say, no, economics, that, that, that's true, that's of interest, but the real issue, I'll tell you the real issue, it's one thing. It was the introduction of the contraceptive pill, effective oral contraception, that at a stroke divided childbearing from sex and thus liberated human beings into different patterns of sexual behavior. We don't have to opt for one or the other. We, we, we say these factors interact together. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to is the ideological, the changes in thought and belief, new ideas, new ways of thinking about what it means to be human, new ways of looking at what it means for something to be right and what it means to be wrong, new ways of ethical reasoning. These are the factors that were also at the core driving forward this revolution, and we need to unpack these in a bit more detail. So let's start with attractive ideology, shall we? What kind of ideology? Well, there have been a number, of course. And in turn, what, what I'm about to talk about is traceable back to other ideological developments. But at its heart, the revolution offered seductive new ideas about what it means to be human. It offered a, a different anthropology. At its heart, it offered today's dominant popular ideology that's called expressive individualism. <coughs> expressive individualism. What, what's expressive individualism? It, it's the picture of the self unencumbered, unburdened by dogma, and authority and tradition. It's a liberated self that has cast off those straitjacketing constraints and formative influences to look elsewhere for its mode of being and for its identity. And where does it look? Where, where do you look today to find out who you are? You, you look within yourself. You look within. And within yourself, you'll discover who you truly are. And it's called expressive individualism because the expression of who you truly are leads to authenticity. It makes you an authentic self, a whole person, unshackled by dogma and authority, liberated to be free, who you really are within. 
And of course, so powerful is this ideology that the ex that expressive individualism effectively made I identify as one of the defining features of our age. I identify as. Now, there are extreme examples of this. Um, I take the case of Rachel Dolezal. I don't know whether any of you saw her uh, reported a couple of years back in the American newspaper. She was over being interviewed on British television recently. Rachel Dolezal reportedly, she was a black civil rights activist. And she was outed by her parents, who said, she's not black. And they put up a picture of her daughter, who was a little blonde-haired girl. And they said, that's our daughter. She is masquerading as a black person to further her own personal agendas. And Rachel Dolezal said, <laughs> Okay, that's true, that's me. And that is my inheritance. But that is not who I am. I identify as black, you see. I identify as the imperialism of the self to define its own meaning and identity and indeed to redefine reality if reality fails to comply. And this is an extraordinary level of, of autonomy and we need to, we could spend time just thinking about the anthropology of the autonomous self because that is what we're looking at. And effectively what our culture has committed to is a personal project of open-ended, ultimately groundless self-making in which I make the rules, I make myself, I seek within the meaning of the universe and seek to be true to who I am. So that's expressive individualism. But after expressive individualism, let, let's move on to this notion of the, re the revolution casting a moral vision. You think a moral vision? I don't see much that's moral about this. Certainly not in my terms, you might think. But this quest for authenticity is closely linked to a moral agenda. You see, when the revolution came along, we Christians, we thought it would be business as usual. Uh, we expected to be able to portray our opponents as depraved sinners, um, moral anarchists. But instead, the sexual revolutionaries portrayed us as the immoral, or as we are today, the immoral minority, the bigots and the little people with your rules and your propensity to cast out and judge the people who don't fit, and the shame that you heap on your children and on your single mums and anybody else who doesn't quite line up with your moral view. You're bigots. You're shame-filled creatures who love to see the little people suffer. And in that extraordinary turning of the tables, this revolution claims moral high ground for itself. Now you say, what's the moral high ground? It's the high ground of being authentic. It's the moral good of being real, of being yourself. You carry on in your shame culture if you want with your hypocrisy, but this is who I am. At least I'm being honest. To, to my true self and I'm trying to live authentically in line with that and I tell you this isn't only good because authenticity surely is good but it leads to freedom from the shackles of Christian shame culture and flourishing and liberation and fairness fairness for the little people whose rights now we're going to establish in law to protect them from people like you and I know some of this, if you're from an Eastern European culture, you'd say, well, I don't know where this guy is. It's not my culture, this. 
it's certainly Western European culture. And if you're in Eastern Europe, I'd just suggest that it's coming your way. And young people that I meet all over Eastern Europe, they know what their culture is saying, but they know what they're seeing on the internet and in the media and in social media. And their hearts are being won, even whilst in terms of civil life, things are still relatively conservative. But let me give you an example of how this moral vision works. Take an example of a gay pride marriage. A marriage? A gay pride march. And take some of the characters that you might see on a, a gay pride march. On the face of it, this looks easy to many Christians. Rules are being broken here, faced with sometimes explicit images of sexual imagery like this and flu fluidity. We, we tend to default to business as usual. We wrinkle our noses, we talk about AIDS, and we hold yet another of our favorite seminars on pornography, which is the way we do sex. We hold seminars on pornography. But people are not listening to that kind of language anymore. Today, image, we have to understand images like this portray moral purpose, the courage of being real. And men and women like this have marched through some of the toughest, most dangerous neighborhoods in parts of the world to exert their right to be themselves. And in our culture, people respond to that. There's something in the human heart which likes to see the little people brought forward and the people who've been pushed to the margins brought in. And we respond in terms of this moral discord with, with shame when, when, when these people say to us, you continue in your shame culture if you want, but this is who I am. And who I am brings freedom and flourishing and fairness. And look at us, we're, in case you missed it, we're happy. Contrast your faces just now. And this is our story, this is our song, you see. Now take a compelling moral vision of authenticity like this and put it in a pot and then stir in attractive ideologies of self-expression and weave them together into great stories of liberation, courage, Harvey Milk, the States. Show some sportsmen who are standing up and saying this is who I am. Cast a few more pictures of little girls with the courage to say, well, I'm like that. And, and you have a revolution on your hand that's being driven by a great story, a story of breaking free, of breaking out, of being real. And of course, in rom-coms and sitcoms and movies and literature, we see this over and over again. The same story, be yourself. You need to be who you are. I remember back in, uh, when was it, about 1970, 77, so we're talking a long time now. I remember the one of the earliest Dustin Hoffman movies, and Meryl Streep, and it was called Kramer v. Kramer. And it was a very moving film because effectively Meryl Streep was a young man, rather with, with, with a little boy, and she suddenly walked out one morning and abandoned him without saying anything and abandoned her husband. And he, the, really the film is about how he has to readjust his life to look after this little boy because he was so busy at work. Um, and you're left thinking, particularly in the 70s, how could a mother treat her son like that until she reappears later in the movie and she wants her son back? And he says, what right have you got to have this boy back? And she says, look, I had to discover who I was, who I am. And in 1977, we were, we were just hearing this, you see, and it was the first, who I am, well, get, get a life and get, get your responsibility for your son was the default. But today, no, no, how can you look after a little boy if you don't know who you are? Oughtn't you to be looking after that little boy from a centeredness, a sense of wholeness in, in yourself? 
And we're much, much more open to that kind of thinking because we've been conditioned by our culture, by the narrative that's at work in our culture. And so, in the words of Don Madonna, I am my own experiment. I am my own work of art. The story is told and sang and lived. And how did we respond as a church to this inspiring story? We tend to respond with facts, with more seminars about what we don't do. But as the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor says, you can't respond to a great story with facts. You've got to tell a better story, a different story. Because our culture thinks the human brain works in terms of stories. And our own saviour, of course, showed us and taught us that. So what's our story? That's the question, isn't it? What's our song? People know what we're against. Got a pretty good idea of what we're against. What are we for? And that's the question. We've got old men like me talking about it. When we look for young good people, women and men, our intellectual capacity is still thin. We need younger people who'll do PhDs in queer theory, who'll get to grips with social analysis and helping us discern the times and understand what's going on in this, don't we? Just as we did for science. And I, I think that's the claim and call of, of God on us right now. And I know some of you are wanting to say, yeah, but let's not lose the gospel. <laughs> and, and I'm right there. Let's not lose the gospel. What the gospel is, but also what the gospel's for. Life for the life of the world. So how do we... Um, yeah, how do we do, present a positive vision is, is the key, isn't it? Um, I had a great illustration recently, and I'd love to share it. Um, there, there's the story of uh, the sirens. Do you remember the, the sirens? The Greek sirens, they, they, they lured men to their sailors, to their death on the rocks as they passed in their boats with their beautiful singing. And uh, what's the story of, of the guy who gets his men to put, what's his name? Odysseus, that's right. And the story of Odysseus is that he wants to hear the, this beautiful, it's said to be the most beautiful, compelling sound, but he doesn't want the boat to be on the rocks and destroyed. So he gets his men to put into their ears wax, the rowers. And they go past and he says, I want you to, before we get into sound, strap me to the mast, which they did. And no matter what I say to you, you need to keep me strapped to the mast. And they come into the earshot of the sirens, these half bird, half women, beautiful song begins to fill the air. The, the, the sailors can't hear anything. They keep rowing. But, but the king, he, 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 he says, um, he, 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 he longs to be free. And he orders his men to let him go. And they carry on rowing. He pleads with them. He begs them. He threatens them. And they keep on going. And he's, he's safe. So that's one way of, of getting past the, the siren call. Strap yourself to the mast. Have another pornography seminar and i'm very much for pornography seminars by the way but but people ask me all the time to give pornography seminars and i always say can you just help me understand what is the series into which this fits and particularly the series which casts the positive vision of what sex is for of which this is a part toward the end i said oh, i haven't got anything on that i said well i don't want to come i just don't take on those kind of offers because that is strapping yourself to the mass, and it, it's, it's one effective way of responding to temptation, to the lure of culture. But then, of course, there was another way, another story 
about Orpheus. And he goes past the same area. And Orpheus is the most beautiful musician, has the most wonderful voice, he's the greatest musician in the world. And as they come into the earshot, his men begin to be taken over by the siren calls and row. And he takes out his harp and he sings and he sings and he fills the air with his music and he drowns out the sound of the sirens. He sings a better song. And that's the other way in which one responds to the seduction of culture and the temptations of our age. You sing a better song. And both are important. There are times when you need to strap yourself to the mast. And there are times when we need to sing. Now is the time when we've got to discover what our song, what our story is and how we begin to share that. So what do we do? How, where do we go from here? Well, I, I think first we've got to do more of the cultural analysis that I've been talking about. If you're interested in apologetics, that is. More kind of discerning what's going on in our culture. But then I think we need to do three things as we get started with our response. We need to say sorry, thank you, please. Sorry, thank you, please. Now why do I say that? Because good apologetics seeks to respond to where people are at, where they're coming from. And of course the famous example of that is what? In the scripture, what's the famous example? Mars Hill, Mars Hill the Areopagus, Acts 17. And what, what do we read there in this fascinating story? We read that Paul goes, spends the morning going around and he's disturbed by what he sees as he sees the idolatry there. And you can imagine him writing Romans 1 in his head as he goes round. They exchange the glory of the invisible God for images and animals and made in human form. And his, his dismay with this and the turmoil it caused him, his anger, and all of those emotions must have been going around. And of course we see them spill out in Romans 1 as he sets out clearly the basis of the turning of the human heart against God and his ways. So when he gets up, they put him up on Areopagus and they say, right, tell us what you think. What does he say? Does he give them Romans 1? Very interesting, very clever. He says, men of Athens, I see that you are very religious. It's interesting. As I walked around and I see all your different gods and idols, and then I come across one to an unknown God. It is of him that I wish to speak. Now what he's doing there is he, he'll come on to the need for repentance toward the end. But what he's doing initially, he's connecting with their spiritual longings. He's connecting with what their hearts are desiring in seeking out those idols. And that's the nature of sin, isn't it? It's taking the things of this world and using them for the wrong end. And what we need to do here is connect with our culture, that hear what it's saying and respond to it. I just noticed this morning as we were reading in Acts, Peter's great sermon. He wants to declare Jesus is risen. But how did you notice how he begins the sermon? He says, Men and, and women, these men are not drunk, as you suppose. So he, he sees that the question they're asking is, what are you lot on? You're crazy. He doesn't say, I'm here to announce Jesus. He says, look, that we're not. The, these men are not drunk. We've, and then he explains. So he connects with where they're coming from. And we need to connect with the moral aspirations of our culture for freedom, flourishing, fairness. We know they're looking in the wrong place, but let's recognize those because we're still humans made in the image of God, disfigured by sin, broken, disjointed, dislocated, but nevertheless longing for something more. And in much of the sexual revolution, people are wanting more but finding less. But we have to connect with that sense first. 
And I think we do that by saying sorry, thank you, please. That's our suggest way in. You may be able to think of something better. Sorry. I'm, I'm personally not in favor of big statements and statements of repentance. I, I think if we start issuing statements, we'll be apologizing for everything in church history. If you think about some of the, some of the, some of the things that have gone on in our history, so so, um, but but I, I do think that that we need to be ready to acknowledge that in our, amongst our own people, um, there is bigotry, there is a readiness to amplify sexual sins above other sins in our own lives of greed, gossip, neglect. We, we do need to acknowledge that sometimes we've, we've not listened to people or tried to connect with their experience. I have to say sometimes, some examples I've seen are shocking of what is written to people. Um, and so I think we need to be ready to say, look, I'm sorry. If, when you tell me about what that person wrote and they're a Christian, that isn't my feeling, I don't feel that way, but I'm a Christian, and will you accept my apology on their behalf? Because this is not the Savior I follow and, and the Lord I know. It doesn't cost anything to do that. We don't need to grovel. We don't need to um, take any action straight away. We just need to be ready. It doesn't cost us anything to acknowledge we've, we've not done well quite often. Sorry. But then thank you, thank you, yeah. Thank you for waking us up. Thank you for telling us that our shame culture isn't enough. Thank you for exposing our starvation diet. Thank you for making us sit up. Thank you for getting us worried. Thank you for bringing us here today to say, well, what is our vision? How have I got through 40 years of the Christian life? And if somebody says to me, what's sex for? And looks at me, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, having to think, and I don't have an imagination around what this is for because I haven't really thought about it. I've covered it in shame and, and haven't got a narrative. So thank you because you're making us think about this really big and important area of our lives. And where you've exposed our hypocrisy, thank you. And where you've told us it's not good enough, thank you. And then, sorry, thank you, please, please, Having owned up to some of our failed promises, we offered life, flourishing, justice. That's what our God's for, isn't he? Justice. And, and we didn't seem like that. We've, we've come clean on that. Please now, can we have a conversation about your promises and the promises that, are, that have emerged in our culture, those promises of freedom, flourishing, Fairness. Would you be willing to hear me out and look at some of those promises in a bit more detail? Because you see, those aspirations are mine too. I want freedom, flourishing, fairness. I just think you get there by a very different way. And those words mean different things. But I share your heart's desire. So can we talk about how well the project's going 50 years in, in terms of freedom, flourishing, fairness? Take freedom, expressive individualism. What, what we have consigned ourselves to there, as I suggested, is a project of open-ended, ultimately groundless self-making. There's no evidence that this leads to any kind of freedom. Look inside yourself, be yourself, it's a slogan. Of course, we, we'd all agree that be real about what is there, is a shared value. Yeah, we, we want to be authentic. We, we want people to be real. Hang on, the word inclusion is our word. Whosoever will may come. That was the gospel I was brought up on. Whoever you are, whatever your experience, you are welcome at the cross. That's, that is the gospel. So be real, please. But when you talk about being real, it's the next bit. And express what you find there and be that thing. Where is the evidence this leads to freedom in the human spirit? It's a slogan. Sounds good. It's peddled over and over. 
It's put to music. It's shown on cell. It's a slogan. Certainly, none of the mental health issues related to identity formation, such as some forms of anorexia nervosa, self-harm rates, there's no evidence that these kinds of disorders are ameliorating and being fixed by our culture of individualism. Indeed, there's a good deal of evidence to suggest that the opposite might be the case. It's hard if you're a self to make yourself, isn't it? Without any reference to external reality, without any point of reference. Let, let me illustrate with, with, with the self-esteem project. The self-esteem project says, we all feel unworthy at its popular level. We all feel unworthy. What's the answer to that? Don't state your sense of self-worth on what other people say. Don't state your sense of self-worth on what you've been told or your, or your performance, because all those things are contingent. You say what you're worth, because no one can take that away from you. You say, I'm worthy. I value myself. I'm special. I attract people to me, even as I talk. I make an impact. I'm a positive person. You see, these kind of self-affirming statements, in one study, about 50% of North Americans will say, I use these kind of self-boosting statements at least once a week. So, how does that work? I'm valuable. The self asserts its own value. Nice little randomized control trial carried out at the University of Hamilton in Ontario. It showed that if you randomly assign people to three groups, and the first group gets these cards and they're told to have half an hour every day meditating on I'm special, I'm positive, I'm powerful, those kind of statements. At the end of the three-month period, the people in that group with low self-worth felt worse than at the beginning. The authors say, these statements may work for people who already feel good about themselves, they feel a bit rosier, but they backfire for the people who need them most. Why? Because it's just your own propaganda. That's all. And if you haven't got much self-esteem, why should you believe yourself in the first place anyway? It's a circularity. And this is a psychological cul-de-sac in which we attempt to define ourselves in a groundless way. And that may be why the modern self is so fragile, so vulnerable and insecure. That might be why, paradoxically, in today's culture, people seem more easily taken hostage to identity labels, LGBT, or to those selling different identities and fear of missing out, and media identity, and so on. It may be because of this, you look inside yourself, it's such a, a hopeless quest, it's a psychological cul-de-sac, that we're more insecure and more prone to searching for these identity labels and staking ourselves on that. It might lie behind in universities the need for safe spaces, where the self is so fragile and vulnerable, it needs to be cosseted and not challenged. So we could have a long conversation about the promise of freedom and what's been delivered in our culture. Similarly flourishing, the human being max optimizing their potential. How, how's the project going? You'd think at least people would be maybe flourishing with the straight jacket taken off in their sex lives. Are people having more sex, better sex, happier sex? Here are the rates of sex, having sex, from a very good British study. And you can see this is the average rates. This gets everyone looking, don't you? So everyone who was doing the feedback things all stop now and they're all watching. This is the average frequency of sex in the last four weeks in the younger age group, 16 to 44. And five times in 1990, four times in 2000, three times in 2010. 
Why, says Professor Spiegelhalter of the University of Oxford Statistics Department, if we extend this graph, no one will be having any sex at all by the year 2040. Now, as a statistician, he knows that you never extrapolate graphs. And he says that. And I doubt very much anyway that that'll be the case. But with the army of sex therapists, we can reasonably in conversation ask, where is the flourishing that was promised? How are we being more as human beings? And what about fairness? And with this I end. Our fairness narrative tends to be filtered through the lens of individualism again. It's what's fair for me. It's my rights. But of course, the other side to fairness is duties. What, what if our emphasis on individual rights is resulting in a failure of our duties to, to the vulnerable? What if the people who pay the price for our adult freedoms are our children? Is it fair on them? We looked at some of the data, didn't we? Half of kids get to the age of 16 with both. Is, it, is that fair? Is there something going wrong in our duties toward one another because of our obsession with our rights for myself? The kids are paying the price for the adult rights, you see, to please myself, to do my own thing. As the family is dismantled, as they become less stable in this way, one study showed that one in 30 kids born between 1992 and 1994 entered care, looked after children, so-called, at some point. One in 30. One in 30 little boys and girls. And children need stability. They love stability. They thrive on coming home at age three, four from nursery and finding the same mum who was there when they left this morning. They love that. And they love it when the same dad comes in and there's a sense of stability. But when that different dad comes in and then another different dad and then the mum gives them up into care, they don't thrive on that. They can't build pictures of trust of the world psychologically for later life. And we have hollowed out and put at risk the lives of generation of kids here as we've pursued our rights and forgot about our duties to one another. And we as Christians need to remember that God has a heart for kids. He loves kids. And E.O. Bakker, in his book, When Children Became People, The Rise of Christianity, he makes the case that it was Christians in the way they treated their children who showed the pagans a better story, a different way of life, treating their children. Because they remembered how Jesus brought the children to him. Why do you think the disciples' default was to send them away? because they're absorbed by their culture, their Greek culture, where children are the bottom of the heap. Send them away. Jesus won't be interested. Jesus says, bring them to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And so Christians from our earliest days loved kids. And, and so we, in our identity as Christians, want to have a conversation about, yes, your rights, but also our duties to one another and how we build strong marriages that are the foundation for stable families that kids just love. And so let's have that conversation. And we could go on, and I'm through now, and you've been very patient, but here's the, the thing. Having said, please, can we talk about um, your failed promises? We have arrived at the point where we have to say, but please now, can we tell a better story? This is our story. This is our song. And we'd love to be able to, to share that with you.